All right. Thank you all for being here this morning. It's a little colder outside than I thought it was going to be um, after quite a week. And thank you for the Center for Texas Studies for asking me. And thank you to the Fort Worth Public Library for all that they're doing on this. But um, what I want to do this morning <clears throat> is to talk about how we can use food as a lens to understand Texas. It's a, it's a fun topic, but it's, it's really just one more way. You know, we look at politics, we look at economics, but food is, is just another way to do that. And so, um, so we will do that. And what I want to do this morning, as Linda's already pointed out, I want to know. All right, so you are at a really good restaurant and the server says to you, do you want cornbread or biscuits with that? All right, let me see, team cornbread. All right, and Linda's back there, corn skillet, no salt, no sugar, okay, good. All right, who wants biscuits? What if they throw a yeast roll in there? Okay, all right, so biscuits definitely win. Well, let's, we will talk more about why that is the case. Um, all right, we'll get started. Corn is amazing. It will grow almost anywhere, has a short taproot, so it doesn't require much water, easy to harvest, easy to process, easy to store. It's easy. And so, by the time the Europeans arrived, corn had spread through virtually all the Americas, north and south, very widespread. And, and a cornerstone, perhaps the cornerstone of the Native American diet. Okay. And in the beginning, first there was wheat. Wheat is um, an Eastern Hemisphere grain. It arose somewhere in Mesopotamia and spread, likewise spread, but it's finickier than corn. Wheat doesn't like heat and wheat doesn't like humidity. So it thrives where it's dry and where it's cool. Um, it's hard to process. Requires a lot more work than corn, but people love it. And it's spread across the Eastern Hemisphere. So what happens, there's this giant I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to move, use my hands. <laughs> There's this giant movement of food and people and disease known as the Columbian Exchange that happens after the Europeans arrive in the Americas in 1492. So Columbus took corn back on at least his second voyage. Europeans didn't like it, but they thought that it would be good for their trading posts in Africa, and so they schlepped it down to the coast of Africa, and actually it did thrive there. Grew very, very well, and actually supplanted a lot of the native grains there. All right, and Europeans, when they come to the Americas, bring wheat with them. It flourishes in the Mexican highlands by 1520, and when the English arrive in Jamestown, they bring it here. So those two grains have crisscrossed the Atlantic very, very early, even though they have origins in the different hemispheres. So, let's talk about cornmeal. It's wonderful stuff. Uh, corn is easy to process. It will last forever before it's processed. Once it's made into cornmeal, it actually spoils pretty easily. Um, but it's extremely adaptable, extremely useful. It's nutritious, it tastes good all of those things, but it doesn't have gluten in it. And so wheat does a couple of things that corn can never do. It can grind down almost to the fineness of powder. I mean, you know, if you were to take some wheat out of the sack and run it through your fingers, it's almost like silk, right? And it has gluten. And so it can do all kinds of things that corn flour can't. The gluten structure allows it to rise, to, to retain air and to rise. So all of this is to say 
that that people like wheat flour. They like it a lot. And everywhere that Europeans go, they try to have it with them. And so what we're going to look, we're going to zip this morning really quickly through a couple of hundred years of history and look at what people in Texas have done with wheat since the arrival of the Spanish. <clears throat> All right. Now, I, you can argue with me and tell me that Los Sedais is not in Texas, that it's in Louisiana, but it was the capital of Tejas, and so I'm going to hold my ground on that, <laughs> and we're going to talk about Los Sedais. It's right outside of Natchitoches, Louisiana today, and it was the capital of Spanish Texas, and we have this amazing map from 1768. It's in the British Library, so what we have there's the large view of that, there's the town view, and then here's the expanded view which shows of the governor's mansion, which shows an oven there on, in the governor's mansion. Uh, they were baking probably bread. And let me say, when, what baking is, baking is using indirect heat. Um, it's not boiling, it's not frying, it's not braising in liquid, it's using indirect heat. And I could talk a lot more about that. Mm -hmm. So what were the Spanish eating at Los Sedais? Well, we know they were eating a lot of cornbread. And we know that they were trading for bear grease with the natives. So they're probably using the bear grease to, to make their cornbread taste better, <laughs> different, more savory, more tender, whatever. But they were also trying to get wheat flour. And um, just, and what they would have to do, since they were Spanish and they couldn't trade through New Orleans, right? They would have to bring it up from Mexico City. And an ox cart from Mexico City to Northwest Louisiana would take most of a year. So, needless to say, wheat was a huge treat in Spanish Texas. Not so much in San Antonio, because it's a little bit closer. But in Los, far fetched Los Adais, there was one, one incident in which, you know, it took months and months and months, and then it arrived wet and nasty. And you can just imagine the disappointment when the barrel of flour is opened and, and it's ruined. So, but so probably lots and lots and lots of corn tortillas, even though they had the oven. All right, so in Anglo, Texas, they start bringing in wheat to the early settlements. Now think about where the early settlements are. They're on the coast, right? Wheat is not going to grow there. It's, it's too warm and it's too humid. There was never any chance of, of growing of growing wheat at um, San Felipe de Austin. So as soon they get that trade started up, and Ken Stevens, I'm looking at you because you could talk to us more about the trade, maybe will. But you can see these are newspapers here in Galveston, 1841. Uh, Durst and Kuhn is offering barrels of flour along with pork and Louisiana brown sugar olive oil, hams, and, and on down. But bear flour is right there at the top. Uh, San Antonio, 1851. I thought this was really interesting. They're specifying that the, the flour is Ohio super fine, and then Illinois and Missouri. So what that flour, what is happening with that flour is it's being farmed in the American states at that point. They were, yeah, there were states by that point, and coming downriver on the Mississippi to New Orleans, and then coming by water from New Orleans over to Galveston or Brazoria or um, one of the other ports. So again, expensive and precious, whereas you can just walk out in your backyard and pick an ear of corn and there you go. So 
Here in North Texas, it was a different matter. <clears throat> I, I'm working on a book called People of the Wheat, Culture and Commodity in the North Texas Borderlands. And um, I would almost, I'm not sure I'll do this, but I would almost argue that North Texas is really more Midwestern than it is Southern. Certainly in climate it is, uh, as we saw this week, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and wheat thrives here. We're just dry enough, we're just cold enough that wheat <laughs> flourishes in North Texas, plus the people who settled here came from the Midwest, not from the South. So they got here and went, Oh, cool! Look, these prairies. We can grow wheat up here, and we don't even have to. We don't even have to cut down the trees because there aren't any, right? <laughs> Although the prairie grasses, you know, were pretty tough in themselves. But one of the projects that I have embarked on is to try to document every flour mill—not corn mill, but flour mill—in the six counties of Tarrant, Dallas, Denton, Collin, Cook and Grayson, so between here and the Red River. And I have found, in, in the period between 1840 and 1992 is when I think the last mill went out, I'm not positive, around 1990, 92. In that 150 year period, there were more than 200 flour mills. Most of them were tiny. Some of them, as you, you all who, who are from this area may remember, that some of them were huge. So um, I did a little poking around to try to figure out how much was going on down around San Antonio and Fredericksburg, because this is, as you can see, since you can read, uh, a, a painting by Carl Lundquist, Lundquist of C.H. Ginter's first mill in Fredericksburg. Um, and the Ginter Mill, of course, still exists in San Antonio. It's owned by a multinational corporation now, but they're still making flour in San Antonio. But a couple of things to point out, and I wasn't able to find that many mills around the area, so clearly the, the bulk of it is up here. The problem is, of course, this is before the railroads, and so it's mostly for local consumption, because again, ox carts. <laughs> ox carts. <laughs> You can tell I'm a teacher, I wonder. Um, <clears throat> it takes a long, long time to get from here to the port at Jefferson on the, on the Red River, um, taking things by ox cart, so it's really not feasible. So most of this is for local consumption. But a couple of things to point out about this painting. Um, here is what passes for a river. You know, and then this is what's called the mill race, where the water comes in and turns the wheel. Now, many of the, um, because you know how, how low the creeks and the rivers get up here during dry months, a lot of the early mills up here were actually powered by treadmill with oxen or, um, oxen or mules. Um, but you can see down, this gives you an example of what life was like outside of, of um, North Texas. This is from Comal County in 1860, and you have all these grind mills. But look, corn, 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 and finally wheat down at the bottom. So not a whole lot of wheat being consumed, not locally grown wheat being consumed in Comal County. Okay. Now, for enslaved people in Texas and elsewhere, it was an entirely different matter. Most enslaved people had to rely, were forced to rely on the people who enslaved them for their food supplies. And so their diet consisted almost entirely of corn and pork. Now, they did what they could to augment. And if they had a chance to, to make money, they, they would, and they frequently spent it. On, on wheat flour and refined sugar. But as you can see in this quotation from Monroe Bracken, most enslaved people ate only cornbread. Once in a while they'd get a biscuit to eat as a treat. So food became a form of power. People who wanted, the enslavers wanted 
to be perceived as benevolent, so they'd give them a little, little flour or a little sugar <coughs> or a little extra molasses or something like that. And um, it was a matter of control, which is not to say that the enslaved people did not enjoy their wheat flour, because they did. So, all right, so we're going to skip over the Civil War. And we're going to look at the new baking that came into being after the Civil War. And those, the new baking after the Civil War relied on three factors. It relied on um, cheap flour. It was becoming industrialized, imported from the Midwest, particularly Minnesota. Cheap sugar, imported from the Caribbean. And I can say a lot more about sugar, which was, which was a devil crop during enslavement. It was just evil. It came at a very high human cost. And the invention of baking powder. So there were chemical leavenings before the Civil War, but they were not real reliable, and they often didn't taste good. So a couple of chemists worked together to combine chemical leavenings and baking, and baking soda and come up with, sh with shelf-stable baking powder. And so the things that we, you know, another thing we could do is talk about the dishes that you perceive as quintessentially Texan or quintessentially Southern. There's nothing quintessentially Southern about the coconut cake, but we, we think that it is. But these beautiful, lofty, multi-layer cakes can exist only because of the existence of baking powder for the, to, raise the, to raise the batter. And of course, Flour becomes cheaper and so more accessible. Transportation is huge, particularly the railroad. When, you can, when a town gets a railroad, it just changes their economic life completely because they can get all that stuff at fairly reasonable prices. So that's, that's when you start having biscuits more often than for Sunday breakfast or for special occasions. And I know... Um, Biscuits become emblematic of a woman's skill in baking, and I know women like my grandmother made dozens of biscuits every morning when her family was growing up. And uh, I always, and I like my uh, former student Leah Legron likes to talk about when her grand, her great grandmother took sick, and her grandmother had to cook the biscuits for the breakfast, and she was just a little girl. And the biscuits came out hard and tough. And her grand, her father, Leah's great grandfather, took the biscuit and rolled it across the table to shame his daughter on the lack of biscuit making ability. And maybe y'all have some stories like that too. Also, after the Civil War, we get the big transition from cooking on an open hearth to cooking in ovens. I really admire our ancestors who understood fire and understood how to cook with fire, to handle it, to keep it, all those things. And so until the first stoves that we would recognize, the first stoves period, really after 1800, and they spread gradually throughout the 19th century so that by 1900 most people were probably cooking in a stove. There were some who still cooked on the open hearth, but not many. So let me talk for that, about that for a minute. What would happen with an open hearth is that you have a live fire in here and you could either, either bake in the ashes down here or you could bake on the superheated hearth. The other thing that people did was this amazing invention called a Dutch oven, which was made of iron. And so a circular container, so you would put your, your baked goods, generally bread, in here, and then heap live coals on the top. Some of you all know how to do that with camping. Um, this is not for sissies. Moving live fire is not for the faint of heart. But this was the... Uh, the Dutch oven was invented in the early 18th century, and so for you know, 150 years it had a great run as a utensil of choice. 
but gradually they gave over to stoves. This, this picture's not quite as vivid as I hoped, but bottom line is this is the firebox where you would put wood or coal, depending on, your, depending on what's available. And then here is the oven. So a lot of stooping involved in that. The early, early ovens did not have um, thermometers, and they didn't even have, and they surely didn't have thermostats. So someone learning to bake in this would have to learn what a slow oven was, what a medium oven was, what a quick oven was, and sometimes it had to do with how long you could stick your hand in there and stand it. <coughs> your, hand became your, your hand became your thermometer. So, or, you know, you can use your face if you choose, but. <laughs> But this transition also, late 19th start, it takes, a, think about it, it takes really a century for the stove to make its complete adaptation. And, and you know, a lot of people in the South and in Texas were really poor after the Civil War, both African Americans and Anglos. And so, you know, you go back, to that, the cake, and say, yeah, but not for everybody, not for most people. Um, in the area that I studied for my dissertation, the Blackland Prairie, which is just to the east of here, 25% of the people owned 75% of the land. And it was occupied by both, by both Anglos and African Americans. Um, so what we have, basically, it's not all that different from the enslaved people's diets. It's called meat, meal, and molasses. And the meat is a form of fat pork. And the meal, of course, is cornmeal. And the molasses is all the sweetening that they have. It might be sorghum syrup. It might be sugar molasses. It might be various things. But it's not flour, and it's not white sugar. Now, that's not to say that people, again, for treats, and people go in debt for their flour so that biscuits become part of the standard accompaniment, but it's not part of what they call living at home. You, know, you, couldn't, raise your own, you couldn't raise a mill your own wheat, you just couldn't. So it's a special treat. Now, in terms of identity, um, I always argue, and y'all can push back on this with me if you want to, that food depends largely more on social class than it does on ethnicity, particularly with African Americans and Anglos. Well-to-do African Americans eat more like well-to-do Anglos than they do poor African Americans. Does that make sense? See what I'm saying? And yet there are some claims to to distinctiveness. Now, how many of y'all know what a tea cake is? What is it? It's, it's kind of a, well, what my would say, um, kind of like a not real sweet baked cookie. Mm -hmm. A not real sweet baked cookie, absolutely. Like a sugar cookie with less sugar. Mm -hmm. And so this man, Albert Mac Mackey from Austin, developed what he called the Tea Cake Project, and you can still find it on the internet, where he asked African Americans to send in tea cake recipes. And the, they came in by the hundreds. And you would think that there would not be that many variations on tea cakes, but you know the one that your grandmother made is really better than the one that his grandmother made, right? And so, so this is one way of, of Mr. Mackey claiming the tea cake is an iconic African American baked good. But it was really funny. I was talking to a food historian from, from back east a couple of months ago, and she said, well, you know, I think of biscuits as African American. And I went, oh, no, <laughs> no, no. It's not anything distinctly African American. So, um, but there are wonderful, as we know, distinctive ethnic baking ways here. The Czechs, Germans, of course, have been in Texas since the very earliest days, since the 1840s. And one of their and many, Germany has a very well developed baking history, baking heritage. But one of the iconic um, 
baked goods that they seem to perpetuate here. I mean, dark breads like rye and pumpernickel for sure, but also something that they call coffee cake, which is close to what we would. This, this particular picture I found has a streusel topping, but it could have other things. And then, of course, who is not so grateful that people came from Bohemia and other places and brought kolaches, right? And kolaches is one of the great, great pieces of Texas food ways. So all of that is to say there are distinctive baking ways despite the prevalence of cornbread and, and simple breads like biscuits. But then, you know, people are always having to up the ante. And I'm just imagining the sharecropper mom who is so proud that she can finally make biscuits seven days a week and send her kids to school with a piece of sausage and a biscuit for their lunch. This is, this is good, right? Well, guess what? The well-to-do kids are bringing in store-bought light bread from town. And all of a sudden, that biscuit just is not so fashionable anymore. And it's really hard for us to imagine store-bought light bread as being anything anybody would ever want. <laughs> But it did. When women could stop making bread at home, they did. And the, the amount of bread homemade at, that, that women baked out of their own kitchens dropped by like 90% between 1900 and 1940, and for sure by 1950. Um, it was just uh, the woman who wrote the, the first Neiman Marcus cookbook said, Homemade bread is gone with the wind. <laughs> um, and, and the commercial baking industry explodes. There really was a Mrs. Baird. Ninny, Bre Ninny Baird really did start baking bread in her house over on Hemp Hill Street. And it really did take off into the multinational co corporation that it is. But you can multiply that many times over. Now, the Bairds took it big early. They became wholesalers early, but there were still a lot of bakeries, small bakeries making bread, and maybe some of y'all can talk about that when you were growing up, what, what bread looked like to you. I grew up on this stuff, so this is what I thought it was. So again, uh -huh. things shift. All right, so I want to fast forward now. You, you talk about the 40s, talk about the 50s, and I want to spend just a few minutes talking about Texas women who are cake entrepreneurs. Baking is always a really great way to, to express ourselves. As my nephew says, it's a love language, and it is in many ways, it's also, but it's also a commercial business. So let's take a look at this. Okay, how many of you either make or love Texas sheet cake. Oh, I can't believe it's not every hand in the house. It's my, one of my very favorite desserts. Well, everything that you read are, says that nobody knows where it came up with and nobody knows why it's called Texas sheet. Sheet, and my mom called, my mom called it sheath. She did not call it sheet, she called it sheath. Everybody says they don't know where it came from. Well. We have really powerful search tools these days, and my friend Stephanie's husband is the master of them all, and so he has taught me a few things, and I found in the Amarillo Globe Times 1960 what is the earliest version of the sheath cake that I have found. It's in the All, About, all Around the Town column by Betty Thompson, Amarillo, October 10th, 1960, it's the exact recipe, and she doesn't give the name of the woman who sent it in. <laughs> it says, another of our tried and true Amarillo cooks has come forward with this recipe for what is called a sheath cake. And there it is. So, is it an unknown Amarillo woman? Who knows? But it's really funny. It's a, it's a great cake, and it's portable. And I gave a talk at the Texas State Historical Association last March and took one with me, and people acted like it was really weird to have a cake at a 
historical conference. I don't know what, what their problem was. All right, another entrepreneur. Anybody heard of Illarita Hilfrich? Well, she was an amateur baker at, in Houston, and her obituary talked about how much, again, love language, how much she loved baking for her families. But cooking competitions were a big thing in the post-World War period, II period. <clears throat> and she took only the second place at the Pillsbury 1966 Bake Off with her tunnel of fudge cake. Anybody know that one? OK, well, it's baked in a butt pan, which has its own story. And it bakes up with a gooey middle, a gooey, fudgy middle. <coughs> it may have only won second place in the cook-off, but it's the most requested recipe that Pillsbury has ever had. And it was so popular that it required the Nordic Weir plant to put on double shifts to meet the demand for butt, for butt pans. So all hail Ella Rita Helfrich, queen of the baking contests. And a third example goes to Austin in 1922. Adam's Extract, maker of the vanilla that I still insist on, also makes food color. And the Adams family was doing pretty well. And Betty Turner Adams and her husband <clears throat> went to the Waldorf Astoria in New York and had devil's food cake. And the story goes that Betty looked at that and said, you know, we could dye that red and sell a whole lot of food coloring. Ta-da, <laughs> red velvet cake. Red velvet cake is really nothing but a chocolate cake with lots and lots of red food coloring and a wonderful icing. So three kinds of, Tex three kinds of Texas innovated cakes right there. Now, since the Immigration Act of 1965, Texas has changed a lot. There are lots of, of people coming from places in the world where they weren't allowed to between 1921 and 1965. So we know there are Vietnamese bakeries in everywhere, but particularly in Houston. There are Ethiopian bakeries. There are all kinds of wonderful foods that we didn't have access to before those immigrant populations started coming. And we could talk more about Mexican, about Mexican food. My, one of my very favorite desserts are the some of the cookies that they sell at Fiesta. Um, that guilt, guilty pleasure. But I have to say that the best thing the best thing that I have had lately, and I'm not exaggerating, is a Texas sheet cake made with Burberry spiced pecans at, an, at Smoke and Ash Barbecue in Arlington. So Burberry is an Ethiopian spice, and it's got some heat to it. And so you've got Texas sheet cake with a kick, and it is phenomenal. So, to what extent do we Texans still identify ourselves by the baked goods that we eat? Oh, I am. We do. We're proud. We like our things. But I think Texas is big enough today, 30 million people, that we can all get together and we can have our biscuits and we can have our cornbread, but we can also have naan and we can have pita, and we can have roti, and we can have all kinds of other good <coughs> stuff too. So maybe the, the lesson at the end is that we identify ourselves as a cosmopolitan people who welcome new food ways, and not just, and yeah, enjoy. So thank you for listening, and I will look forward to your questions and your reminiscences and your comments. agreed with me on the cast iron skillet and no sugar. Um, okay, how many sugar cornbread in your cornbread? <laughs> how many no sugar in your cornbread? Yeah. But okay. people get into fist fights uh, over that. 
right, we had several people that were looking forward to the presentation. Um, some, oh, somebody said the audio wasn't very good. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, we had somebody wanting to be team both versions of cornbread. <laughs> uh, restaurant cornbread is always sweet, yeah. not real cornbread. Something said, oh. Um, my friend Ronnie Lundy says if God had intended for cornbread to have sugar in it, he would have called it cake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sure. Um, not so long ago, I was reading some um, old cookbook, and they talked about a cold oven. Or you know, when you mentioned that, I thought I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How do you determine which one? You know, like that, it just said it, it was like a cold. It was warm of it. I mean, it was not a temperature. It was definitely that. Right. Uh, so the question is, how do you determine between a cold oven, a warm oven, um, a fast oven, things like that? Again, you, it's a lot of it's trial and error. You have to know um, what what it feels like. Basically, there are different uh, there are different tests. Like you can throw cornmeal on the basis of on the bottom of the oven and see how long it takes to brown, for example, or how long it takes a sheet of paper to burn. That's one way to do it, but I suspect that a lot of a lot of cooks just use their hand and and knew by experience, and that's why I say I admire them so much. And it's really interesting because you see this transition in the 1920s. Um, one of the great things about my work is that I get to spend hours and hours and hours reading old cookbooks, and I and I still learn new things. Um, so I was up at Texas Woman's, which has a phenomenal cookbook collection. And, um, and in, in the 1920s, that you still see that in the cookbook. Sometimes they'll, they'll give a temperature, but sometimes they'll still, still say fast or slow. Cold is cold. Um, you know, but the only thing I know that start maybe you all know differently, the only thing that I know that starts in a cold oven are these little things called popovers. Most everything else starts in a preheated oven. So you get, the, you get the oven hot, you get the air hot. And the way this works in a wood-burning oven, the old-time wood-burning wood oven, not stove ovens, is that you put the fire in, get it to a certain temperature, and then move the fire out. Physically remove the fire from the oven. I know, and can you imagine? And, and there were stories about enslaved women being beaten because they burn this or that. All this and you expect perfection too. Yeah. Okay, we've got, uh, one person was wanting to know what is this sweetener that Native Americans used? The answer is not much. Yeah. Um, well, they said that there was a root. I think they might be talking about arrowroot maybe? Uh, I, I don't think, the only sweetener that I'm aware of is um, something called honey locust and dried fruit. Dried okay. fruit would be a really great one. Anybody? What about sugar beets? Not here. <laughs> That's a good question, but not here. And you know, I don't know, I, I, I would, does anybody know, do sugar beets come from Europe? I never ever thought about that. Yeah, we used to grow them uh, here in the uh, 40s. Yeah, but I'm thinking about in the early days, I don't think they were native. And so another one of our Zoom commenters said that um, when someone was baking, they would put a little bit of the batter in the oven to give the kids cookies, you know, a little treat. And like they would be baking a cake mm -hmm. and put a little bit in in little mm -hmm. spots. And somebody else asked if that was true. I don't know why it wouldn't be. <laughs> My mother did that. She made pies. The, the leftover yes. crust was roly polies, is what she called them, but I think that's a root. She's from Kentucky, so that might be a regional. She's from the South, though. Yeah. We'll, we'll count Kentucky as the South. She's from Ohio. Oh. Oh, that's South. I have a question yeah. that might ask you to kind of think about maybe cooking as well as this latest book, and, and that's to think about the influences of. 
of Cook's, you know, the kind of cross-class influences are things, did things uh, enter into the kind of middle-class delicacies? I mean, I, you're thinking about access <coughs> to flour and all of that limiting going, going down the chain, but I'm wondering, was there anything that, that people brought sort of that made more familiar or made the kids of elite families, like any baking traditions? No? I'm, not, I'm sorry, oh, Stephanie, I'm not following you. you. summarize for the Zoomers? Okay, like, I'm not sure I can. Books, for folks who were black or whatever, uh -huh. who came into middle class homes, uh -huh. did they bring any of their traditions okay. into the middle class homes? Okay, I see the question. Um, the question is, did African American cooks in middle class homes bring their cooking traditions into, um, into elite families? Because right. I think a lot of Southern food comes from from, you know, greens and stuff like that came from that direction, that, you know, white folks think all that food is great in part because of their, the influence of their cook. And I'm wondering if there's any baked goods that, that came in that direction. It's, it's really interesting because to think about the role of African American domestic workers in baking, we have to consider what some people call wok presence, that it matters who is handling the wok. That there are some people, you know, there are people who just throw up their hands and go, I can't bake. So, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Stephanie. Whose hands do the baking? That matters. It absolutely matters. And it matters with the sentiment of children who, who would say, our families cook, who they would give some pejorative name to, you know. Um, used to make this and I loved it. But in terms of the actual traditions, what's so impressive to me is that relatively few of the African baking traditions made the transition. But African American cooks learned to bake European style without being able to read, without having formal training in chemistry, with having high penalties for screwing it up, and they still manage to maintain, some of them, truly standards of excellence. There are you know, notations of, of enslaved women who excelled, for example, in fruitcakes, or you know, this kind of bread, or that kind of bread. So clearly, I don't know that that answers your question, Steph. It, it sounds like that's one of the things where the, the transition went the other direction, right? Um, yeah. Baking because of the cost of the ingredients was really top down instead of bottom. Yeah. Any bottom off. Yeah, I think I think you're right. She, she said that it sounded like like baking was more top down than bottom up. I think that's correct and I wish I'd used that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. Yes, ma'am. Um, did you you said you've read a lot of cookbooks. What were the what were the major cookbook influences of the time? As, and how did they change over or did people not add cookbooks? Oh, that's a great question, and I, how, what time is it? <laughs> um, cookbooks have been around in English. They go back a lot longer. They've been around in English since the medieval period, and a lot of them have been digitized, and you can see them right there on the Internet. They're phenomenal. And um, so very interesting. For example, um, in the medieval period, what we would call, they, they used to bake um, a savory pie, what we would call a, a meat pie, and they would make it this really tough, thick crust and, and put the meat in it and then fold it up and bake it in that crust instead of in a pan, and they called them coffins. And so you'll see things like such and such bacon, you know, pigeon baked in a coffin. Well, that's what that means. But those crusts were pretty much inedible because they were made to be tough because you didn't want it to bust and your pigeon run out into the fire, right? Um, so the first American cookbook is in the 1790s, and we don't know a whole lot about it except it was a New England woman named Amelia Simmons. First Southern cookbook was in the 1820s, a woman named Mary Randolph from Virginia. First Texas cookbook was Houston in the 1890s. Um, the big influences are really people like Fanny Farmer, 
who, uh, well, actually goes back earlier than that. There were some amazing cookbook writers all through the 19th century, almost all of them women. But it's Fanny Farmer who standardizes what a tablespoon means, what a cup means, this kind of thing. And so that's when you start seeing what we consider our standard recipes with the list of ingredients and then the directions. So, yeah. There was another hand back here. Yes, sir. What did the cooks on chuck wagons carry with them? Cornmeal, wheat, sugar? Good question, and some of y'all some of y'all know that answer better than I do. I would think it would be some combination of all of the above. And again, and coffee. Yeah. Lots of coffee, yeah. Yeah, lots of coffee. I would think it would have to be some combination. The problem with cornmeal, and I said cornmeal is almost perfect. The one big thing that's bad about cornmeal is the stuff we get today is what's called degerminated, and it's basically the outer part of the corn, not the inner part of the corn. If you don't degerminate the cornmeal, it'll spoil in a real hurry. And spoiled cornbread is nasty. I mean cornmeal, spoiled cornmeal is nasty. And so I'm guessing that rather than carrying meal, that they would carry dried corn and would grind what they needed as they needed it. There are lots of accounts of families having hand mills. And there are also a lot of accounts of the enslaved people commentators would be just horrified because the enslaved people would spend all day from can see to can't see out in the fields and come in and still have to grind their cornmeal for their suppers. Okay, the comment was that chuck wagons probably carried flour as opposed to cornmeal. So thank you for that. Okay, let me get some more of our questions from our Zoom people. Um, Okay, um, Daddy was from Georgia. Mother would make us his favorite corn pone, which was hot water cornbread. Just cornmeal, salt, bacon grease, and hot water. Drop spoonfuls onto a hot griddle or bacon oven until crispy and brown. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else says, are hoe cakes and Johnny cakes a product of the Southern migration post-Civil War into Texas? Okay. Hoe cakes have been around as long as there have been humans, practically. Um, oh, we can't go back to the PowerPoint, that's fine. No, it's fine. A hoe cake is really just a flat cake. Uh, the easy, uh, and I've done this, the easiest way to make a corn cake is just to mix cornmeal with water. It's not great, but it's edible. And it's easier to eat than raw cornmeal. So, and then you start adding things to it, you add, some fat to make it tender, whether it's pork fat or bear fat or butter or whatever. And then you add some salt to give it some savor. And then if you're really crude, you might add some sugar. <laughs> no. um, but you know, you can, eat a, you can eat a pone made of cornmeal and water. And I suspect that a lot of our ancestors did. In hard times, you can do that. And you, so you can bake it on the hearth or what the Native Americans did was they would um, build the fire on the ground and over time that ground would become just as hard fired as any tile. A great baking surface. But then if you could have a metal plate or uh, even a rock plate, there's some, some uh, evidence of, of flat stones being used as griddles. But, um, what a, a hoe really was, and whether it was the actual hoe that they used in the, in the garden or not is open to debate, but any metal plate is gonna conduct, con, gonna conduct heat. So, um, those, those, yes, migration into Texas certainly, but they've been around forever. And Johnny cakes can be hoe cakes, it's, Curious though, one of the main definitions I've seen of Johnny Cakes is that they were put on a board and then the board would be placed vertically with its face to the fire so it got a really crispy exterior. But it's really just a pone cooked in a different way. <coughs> so 
Uh, somebody else asks, do cookies <coughs> descend from women trying to see if the oven was hot enough to bake the cake? I don't, I think cookies are just their own thing. They're, they're, cookies are great because they're, they're um, you can bake them on anything. They're faster to bake than a cake. They're not as finicky as cakes. There's a lot more margin for error. I don't know how many of you, you had mothers who go, don't walk hard, you'll make the cake fall. Well, cookies are not going to do that because they don't rise that high. I'm sorry? Don't slam the door. It's yeah. Another one of the things. Right, right, yeah. Because look at all those expensive ingredients. You don't want them to go to waste. So cookies really evolved as their own things. You know, reading early cookbooks, it gets very confusing because they call everything cake. A cookie is a cake. A cake is a cake. <laughs> a loaf of quick bread is a cake. Everything's a cake. So you have to actually look at the ingredients and sometimes the directions that they have it and figure out what the heck they're talking about. Now, I will say that one of the fascinating things that I learned is that the two most persistent sweets among Western Europeans are the fruitcake and gingerbread. Gingerbread has been around since the medieval period, and it was the primary sweet among every household in the Americas, and I would guess in Western Europe as well. So I've, I've always found that very, very interesting. I love gingerbread. And, um, it's good stuff. So any, next time you make gingerbread, just think, okay, I'm doing my medieval thing. Yeah. Yes, sir? Do you have any history evolution of the flour tortillas? <sighs> yeah. the corn tortillas have been around forever. I mean, since I, no, I don't, but a lot of smart people do. Jensen, do you know anything about that? Yeah. It makes a lot of sense because it's basically just a, a pone that's rolled, right? And, and, and baked on a flat surface, a kumal. So, and I believe the flour tortilla would have arisen shortly after the Spanish got here. And it's interesting because there are some, some websites and things like that on decolonizing one's diet. And the thing that they really, so using only materials that were here before 1492, and one of the big things is eliminating the flour tortilla in favor of only the corn. I was gonna ask a question about cookies as well, because that was a really big thing for my grandmother when, uh, I mean, when she moved down here to Texas, which had been uh, 1920-ish, you know, and the variety of, of cookies. And that's my hmm. question is, so we talked about cakes and stuff, but where did the cookies come from? I mean, how, at what point does cookies take over? Cookies have been around a long time because they, again, um, don't require a lot of leavening, and so and and again they're quick. So you need the flour and you need the sugar, and then a, a cookie is incredibly adaptable. You can put anything into a cookie, and we see it's. And, but what's really interesting to me, and that I haven't figured out, is how a cookie becomes southern, if you will. So like the I see, I never grew up with rocks. Y'all know the cookies called rocks. They're, hmm? Russian rocks. Russian rocks, right. I'd never heard of those until I started reading cookbooks. And then I see a, a notation from the 1940s that say, no southern cookie spread would be complete without these. And I'm going, what? Yeah. I come from 19 generations of southerners and I've never heard of these. So, you know, how you define cookies. But I think adaptability and ease and portability you know, cakes are hard to transport, cookies are easy, cookies are sturdy, which is one of the great things about a fruitcake. Fruitcakes are incredibly sturdy. All jokes aside, fruitcakes are sturdy. Um, so that doesn't really answer your question, but they've, they've been around. It's just a matter of who wants to tinker with them and make them into what. The Toll House cookie was an invention, well, you know, Hershey's invented the chocolate chip, and then a cook came up with, with the Toll House cookie and so on, and then Southerners pro I started to say Southerners added pecans, but that's probably not true. Uh, probably Nestle added pecans. <laughs> you know, I don't. I don't know. So.
So one of our Zoomers says, in the 1950s in Fort Worth, my mother bought Ballard refrigerated biscuits. She'd take the baked biscuits, cut them in half, spread with butter and sprinkle with sugar, then bake in the oven again until they were crunchy. Called them sugar tops. That sounds delicious. It does. The refrigerated biscuit is a uh, miracle of um, technology. They were invented by a man named Willoughby in Kentucky who just came up with this great idea and you know, made the little cardboard tube and glued the tops on and it wasn't too long before one of the major corporations bought him out and here we are, right? So, another thing is uh, my mom was a big believer in brown and serve rolls. That was what she used for special occasions. And uh, that's called, the formal name for that, the industry name for that is interrupted baking. And that was discovered by a firefighter in Florida when he was in the middle of baking a, a batch of, of rolls and got called out on a call, pulled them out of the oven, came back and they were still perfect, finished baking them and away we go. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try and capture some of these earlier comments. Um, we had some more feedback on the uh, cast iron skillet with no sugar. Um, give me just a second to scroll here. Um, somebody said that whether they ate cornbread or biscuits, it depends on what they're eating That's as true. the entree. And I say absolutely. But uh, they said if you're gonna, if they have to choose, it's gonna be biscuits. Um, then let's see here, come on. So yes, um, Dr. Sharpless's new book is out and uh, Dr. Lyle says it's amazing. <laughs> um, and someone said the best chocolate cake in reference to the sheet cake question. Uh, somebody else has been making it for 60 years. So that fits exactly because 1960 to mm -hmm. now is 62. Um, somebody else says, my mom called it sheath cake too. I recently tried to say sheet, and she's going back to sheath though. <laughs> and I, I, I know that there's been some discrepancy in my own family on that, just depending on who you were asking. Um, somebody else says that your cake at TSHA was delicious. Well, so more cakes at conferences, <laughs> just going forward. Um, Somebody asks, do you have a recommendation for the ultimate source for classic Texas recipes for those of us who would like to bake some at home? That's a good question. Of course, there are more cookbooks than there are fleas on a dog. Um, one that I, I, and unlike Stephanie Cole, I am not good at pulling out <laughs> authors and titles, but um, the, the, the woman who was editor at Texas Highways for years and years has a cookbook. It's not just baked goods, but it's immigrants' daughters. So not the immigrant, not the immigrant generation, but their daughters. And every cookbook in there, Stephanie's going to Google it for us. Uh, every recipe in there is absolutely divine. Um, so let's let Dr. Cole do her work, and then we'll come back to that. All right, and then we've got uh, somebody says, thank you, very entertaining this morning. Somebody else says that you must have sugar in your cornbread. Um, I, I don't know if this happened to anybody else, but when I was in elementary school, I thought we had yellow cake on our <coughs> plate lunch one day. Mm -hmm. It was not cake, it was cornbread, but I did not recognize it as such. Um, there was another commenter that said that her mom used to always use a cast iron skillet and cut the cornbread it was a nine inch skillet, she would cut it into wedges like pie. And so we didn't cut ours into wedges, but it was baked in the cast iron skillet. And so um, having it in little squares, like a sheet cake, I thought it was cake. Well, I came across recently a reference to an April's, April Fool's joke back in the 30s in which the woman baked very thin layers of cornbread and then iced it with chocolate frosting and served it as a cake and people just thought that was uproariously funny and I'm like, I think that sounds pretty good actually, <laughs> you know? If you get no chocolate frosting on there and you got kind of the crunch and the savor from the cornbread, I think that might be just fine. I, I think I know the answer to that. 
as a historian, if you think about food and history and a way to understand history, do you think maybe baking specifically has been more of a uniter or more of a divider? Okay. I think your talk gave examples of both. Jensen's question is whether, whether baking has been more of a uniter or a divider. And the answer is that it absolutely depends because people in power clearly used it as a way to maintain their status and to withhold good things from other people, whether, whether as enslaved people, as sharecroppers, as grocers charging <coughs> incredible <coughs> interest rates, all those things. But within groups, it's a uniter so that we have all this nostalgic, my grandmother did it like this, my aunt did it like this, that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? But yeah, it's um, our, my, my very, very smart Alan Galay, colleague Alan Galay always says, follow, follow the power, follow the money. And that's certainly true in the case of, of baking and groceries in general, and food in general, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, somebody else says, old cookbooks are interesting to read, no temperature, and cook until done, brown, or whatever. And like you mentioned, I have the utmost respect for people. I mean, I have a hard enough time cooking in an oven that has a thermostat on it. I can't imagine what that must have been like. Definitely a skill. And it probably didn't have glass windows in it. Right, no, 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 that kind of tempered glass didn't come in until probably after World War II. And, and we boomers, of course, remember the, the turquoise and copper tone and uh, harvest gold kitchens that, that our mothers had. My mother actually, my mother actually took our refrigerator, well, didn't take, had, had the Beebrick Auto Company come pick up our refrigerator and paint it avocado. <laughs> I think that is it from our Zoomers. I'm having a little trouble with the mouse here. Yes, sir. When are you going to bring up the sample tray? <laughs> <laughs> well, if those people at TSHA had reacted more positively, I might have done it. Yeah, but they ate it all, Becca. No, they didn't. Oh, they didn't? Oh, no, I, took, I brought it home and froze it, <laughs> which is another thing about sheath cake. It freezes beautifully. <laughs> Crisco is a big deal. Okay. Yeah. Crisco was invented. At, okay, we have a question about what I will call butter substitutes and lard substitutes. Um, that it was always a big deal trying to find a substitute because butter is seasonal and difficult, and lard can be very inconsistent depending on the pig and the skill of the lard maker. And so very early they started looking for substitutes. And weirdly enough, Crisco is cotton seeds that have been processed and, as we say, hydrogenated. So not really food. Huh? So not really food. Well, if it's edible, it's food. And it's, you know, it's got various, but, but it's really interesting because they had to figure out how to get it not to stink. And so that was, it's all very interesting chemical stuff and it's, and it's interesting to watch people. Um, I don't know about y'all, I grew up on oleo. Mama didn't use butter. And she used Crisco. I, I no lard in my household. Um, so the substitutes took over, which is good for vegetarians. Yeah. Had two more comments on the Zoom. Uh, one person says the two main causes of death of our women ancestors were childbirth and related illnesses and death from fires of skirts catching on fire. Not hard and, to believe. You know, not only with the cooking, but also with the washing of clothes, you had to heat the wash tub on a fire. So um, then also interesting that Zora Neale Hurston chose tea cake for the love interest in their eyes were always watching God. Yes. Yes, tea cake is a good, good guy. So I've got two names that I don't know which one it is. One is Paula Forbes and one, one is Linda West Eckhart. Both of them wrote Texas cookbooks. Does either one of them ring a bell to you? 
No, because I'm not you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but there are also a number of good Texas Junior League cookbooks. Junior League cookbooks are amazing. And I know the uh, Fort Worth History Center, we do have uh, a lot of cookbooks from some local organizations, uh, including, I think, the Kimball Museum. Uh, some of those are in remote storage, though, so be sure and check the catalog before you head over to make sure that what you want to look at is actually on site right now. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.